In this video, we're gonna continue our talk on coagulation factors. Like I said, problems in heme a lot of times stem from either too little of something or too much of something. In our last video, we talked about uh, too little of something. Too little coagulation factors. Uh, you can have deficiency from liver disease. You can have it from vitamin K deficiency. We talked about how sometimes we want to induce it with drugs like heparin and warfarin. Well, this talk is another continuation on too little coagulation factors. So a deficiency in coagulation factors. And then in our next video, we'll talk about too much. So deficiency is the name of the game of this video. Um, when you hear deficient coagulation factors, you'll have signs like bleeding. Because we're talking about co coagulation factors, you're gonna have signs like late bleeding, deep bleeding, bleeding in your joints, bones. That's just a recap of what's seen when you have deficiency. So I'll just write bleeding. And here's our nice pathway. The first couple of disorders I wanna talk about is gonna be in the hemophilia family. So hemophilia. Hemophilias are inherited disorders and it's a defect in the intrinsic pathway. You're not making certain factors in the intrinsic pathway. So you can have hemophilia A, B, C. Hemophilia A is due to a defect and decreased production of factor eight. There we go. So factor eight. Hemophilia B due to a defect and decreased production of factor nine. All right, nine. C, can you guess what it is? If you said 10, you're wrong, because 10 is the common pathway, it's not part of the intrinsic, we're talking about the intrinsic here. So you'll jump up to 11. 11. Something important to note, like I said, it's an inherited disorder. A and B are gonna be X-linked recessive, while C is gonna be autosomal recessive. I've seen a lot of questions that just ask you know, what's the inheritance pattern of these, so know them. They all share something in common, however, they're all problems with secondary hemostasis, so you're gonna have signs of that deep, late bleeding. And if you have chronic deep, late bleeding, then one of the things, one of the complications you can develop is painful joints. Why is that? Well, blood isn't very good in your joints, you can imagine. A blood proteases can destroy cartilage, you get chronic inflammation, you get iron de deposition, so you can get chronic joint pain. I'll just write chronic joint pain. Chronic joint pain. Then something else it shares. Because it is all due to defects in your intrinsic system, you're gonna have you're gonna have abnormal lab findings. Do you remember the test that tests for the intrinsic pathway? Do you remember what that is? That'd be your PTT. So PTT is elevated. How about your PT? PT is extrinsic, it has nothing to do with it. How about your bleeding time? Bleeding time is platelets, has nothing to do with it. The PTT is elevated. <clears throat> Now the severity of disease depends on how much or how little um, you're making. So sometimes you can have very minor disease where you're just making slightly, just, just slightly less. Sometimes you can have very severe disease where you're making a lot less. Uh, treatment, if it's very severe, then you'll just give these concentrates to the patient. The one difference, however, is hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is a tad different. Hemophilia A, like I said, is due to decreased factor eight. And in the blood, factor A can circulate and also binds to something. Do you know what it binds to? Binds to von Willebrand factor, and they, they go together like a horse and carriage. They stabilize each other. So factor A stabilizes von Willebrand factor, von Willebrand factor stabilizes factor A. So they, they really like each other. And a way you can treat hemophilia A is by giving desmopressin. Desmopressin, you might be thinking, Desmopressin isn't that the ADH analog for things like diabetes insipidus? You're absolutely right. And through some unknown mechanism, it also increases the release of von Willebrand factor from the endothelium. What stores von Willebrand factor in the endothelium? Can you remind me? The bureau. We will play bodies. So it releases that von Willebrand factor, it'll bind and stabilize any factor A you have and kind of prolong its life and give you a little bit more factor A. That's something you should know for hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is also important because there's another disease that looks very similar to it. And we call that disease, I'll write it up here. Maybe, <laughs> there we go. Coagulation factor 
inhibitor disease. This is when you make antibodies against a coagulation factor, in particular factor eight, the, the one in question basically. So that's why it can look very similar to hemophilia A, because they'll destroy factor eight and you'll have low factor A and you'll think, oh, this person has this person has a hemophilia A. However, you can tell the two apart because if you add the patient's serum to normal serum, then that normal serum will give the patient factor eight. That will increase factor eight. And if the patient has hemophilia A, then it kind of kind of helps hemophilia A. Yeah, it kind of almost cures it. And so PTT will normalize and clots will be able to form because you, you've normalized it. However, if the patient has coagulation factor inhibitor disease, then that antibody will destroy factor eight. Yeah, you can give as much as you want, but the antibodies are still there. They'll, they'll destroy the factor eight. So factor eight won't really rise, therefore PTT will stay elevated and you won't be able to form clots. That's how you tell them apart. Know the mechanism because they like to question, question because they like to ask that because they, they look similar, they want to trick you. So that's how you tell those two apart. <clears throat> now I want to move on to mixed disorders. So this is a deficiency in both platelets, so primary hemostasis, and coagulation factors, secondary hemostasis. Mixed disorders include things like von Willebrand's disease, includes things like DIC, includes things like hyperactive plasmin. We'll start with von Willebrand's disease first. Von Willebrand's disease is due to um, decreased production of von Willebrand's factor. So I'll just write decreased von Willebrand's factor, inherited. And when you have a decreased von Willebrand factor, then you'll recall one of the first steps is von Willebrand factor will bind to collagen and from that your platelets will bind to that von Willebrand factor. If you don't have that, then that platelet will never bind. So you have a problem with primary hemostasis. And because that platelet never binds and it never kind of activates everything else, so you have a problem with secondary hemostasis. That's why it's a problem with both. That's why it's called mix. Now let's see if we can figure out <clears throat> the lab findings. Let's see if we can figure out the lab findings. What will be your bleeding time? It will be elevated, will be normal. It will be elevated. Your platelets can't bind. There's a problem with your platelet binding. Therefore, you have increased bleeding time. How about your PTT, your intrinsic pathway? Normal or abnormal? It will be elevated. Why is that? Didn't I say von Willebrand's factor uh, stabilizes factor eight? Where's factor eight found? In your intrinsic pathway. How about PT? Will it be normal, abnormal? Normal. It has nothing to do with these. Uh, the, the extrinsic pathway. <clears throat> now, just for bonus points, what is the most specific test we can test for in, in disorders with von Willebrand factor and its binding? If you said Ristocene test, high five. High five me through the screen. You're absolutely right. So Ristocene will be abnormal. That's kind of a dead giveaway. Ristocetin, abnormal. How do you treat it? You can increase von Willebrand factor. We just talked about a drug that does that. That'd be your desmopressin. Now let's talk about DIC. That's next on our list, DIC, is when you have some sort of systemic inflammation. Commonly sepsis. When you have systemic inflammation, then your tissue will release factors, including tissue factor, and all these microthrombi will start to form and it will consume all your platelets, consume all your coagulation factors, <clears throat> and use them all up, and it's not linear. As you start to increase more and more tissue factor, then you'll exponentially create more thrombi. So it's not linear. You're going to consume all of your platelets and your coagulation factor, making these thrombi. Your vessels are going to have full, are going to be full of these thrombi. And as your blood passes through it, you're going to have hemolytic anemia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, because it's going to basically share your red blood cells apart. Now you have all these thrombi. Your body doesn't like that, so it starts to activate your fibrinolytic system. So plasminogen, plasmin to break down those clots. So that'd be your second kind of stage of DIC. When you break down those clots, you'll start to bleed. Yeah, you'll bleed a ton. And 
If you want to try and stop the bleeding, you can because you've used up all your coagulation factors. So you're just going to bleed out and you'll bleed from everywhere. You're going to have mucosal bleeding, epistaxis. If you have an IV line or some sort of line, you'll bleed out of that. So you'll bleed out of basically every orifice you have. It's quite horrible. I'll just write bleed out. Where some causes of DIC, we said systemic inflammation is not very specific. So let's get into some more specifics. Causes, you can have sepsis. That's very common. <clears throat> so bugs like E. coli, because it's the most common cause of sepsis, things like Neisseria meningitidis. They release endotoxins that damage your that damage your vessels. You can have trauma, where you release tissue factor because of that trauma. You can have obstetric emergencies, so things like retain products, things like placental eruption, things like amniotic fluid embolus. Due to inflammation, because you're already at a hypercoag state, amniotic fluid in particular has something called thromboplastin, which is similar to tissue factors. So that's another way you can do that. Pancreatitis, because those enzymes will leak out and basically digest your vessels and cause the whole pathway. Malignancies, we talked about a uh, specific leukemia that's known for DIC. Can you remind me what that is? Bonus points if you got it right, that'd be AML. You can also have it from adenocarcinomas because mucin can uh, cause inflammation of your, of your vessels and cause DIC. Transfusion reactions, where you just have a, basically a, bo a bodily reaction to the products you're giving. Nephrotic syndrome, due to loss, when you have nephrotic syndrome, you have a loss of protein that you can lose certain coag factors and kind of throw off the balance. And then a rattlesnake bite. There's a video on YouTube where a person puts rattlesnake poison in um, blood and shakes it around and within a few seconds it turns into like jello. So it's a very strong coag. Now that's a lot of associations. What do we do whenever we see a ton of associations? We take a second, think of some stuff we know about these and kind of synthesize it all in a step-like question. All right, so pause the video, take a second, just kind of go through some of these. I'll go over some um, obstetric emergencies like placental eruption, that'd be painful, third trimester bleeding, pancreatitis, elevated life pace, um, commonly seen in chronic alcoholics, malignancy, AML, that's one of the hour rods you treated with uh, retinoic acid, that's vitamin A. So just that just helps recap and kind of reintroduce some other blocks into, into heme. That's what causes DIC. Now let's see if we can find out what the lab findings look like. So our right, labs of DIC. We have our bleeding time, PTT, PT. Bleeding time, what's it gonna look like? We're consuming our platelets, so bleeding time's gonna be elevated with a low platelet count. And then PTT and PT, we're consuming all our coag factors, so both of these are gonna be elevated. You're gonna see signs of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, so micro, things like um, schistocytes, things like elevated LDH, schistocytes. And then, more importantly, because you're activating your fibrin fibrinolytic system and you're breaking down those fibrin clots, you're gonna see products of those fibrin clots. So elevated D-dimer. Elevated D-dimer is a big one that you should know, okay? That's just the products of a fibrin. That's DIC. There's something that looks very, very similar to it. And you know how the test likes to test things that are very similar just to kind of throw you off? And that would be hyperactive plasmin. Hyper active plasmin. Just to recap our fibrinolytic system, plasminogen is activated by things like urokinase, TPA, streptokinase, and the plasmin, and then plasmin will eat fibrin. If you leave plasmin activated for too long, it will actually start to eat everything else. So it will start eating fibrin, move on to fibrinogen, move on to coag factors, and just start eating everything else. So we want to stop that, and we stop it by a protein called Alpha-2 antiplasmin. What a fitting name. That just kind of stops it, keeps it in check. <laughs> and hyperactive plasmin disorder, you can probably guess what's going wrong. You have hyperactive plasmin. So you're either making too much 
or you can't stop it. And so eat fibrin and then start moving on to fibrinogen and coag factors. So some causes, prostate surgery. Um, prostate surgery is released a lot of urokinase. So prostate surgery. You have liver disease. Liver diseases cause you to bleed just because you have decreased coag factors, but you're also making decreased alpha-2 antiplasmin. Decreased alpha-2. All these can cause plasmin to work more, be hyperactive. What are the lab findings? This looks very similar clinically to DIC. We have to tell it apart with our lab findings. So we'll have bleeding time, PTT, and PT. Bleeding time is actually gonna be elevated. Why is bleeding time elevated? Well, after each fibrin, it'll move on to fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, recall, is that drape that goes over your platelets and kind of aggregates it and forms that temporary plug. If you don't have fibrinogen, then platelets can't really aggregate as well. That's why you have elevated bleeding time. However, your platelet count is going to be normal. Normal. As opposed to DIC where you're consuming platelets because you're making clots and it'll have low platelets. PTT and PT are going to be elevated. How about D-dimers? D-dimers are actually going to be lowered. D-dimers are from fibrin products. And it might be elevated initially once you eat and destroy that fibrin, but as you move on into fibrinogen and upwards, if you break down fibrinogen, it'll never become fibrin and you'll never be able to make that fibrin plug in the first place. And so D-dimers will start to be decreased. That's another big giveaway. How do you treat this disorder? You want to stop the formation of plasmin. There's a drug we talked about in our last video that stops the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. Do you remember what that is? That's your amino caproic acid. Very good. That is deficiencies in coagulation factors. I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.